Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my better professional half, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Always good, Mark. How are you this week? I'm very well. I felt the need to specify that on the basis that people might get confused. I sometimes say, well, you know, my partner says this, my partner says that, and then people look at me funny. It's like, so you and Walker, and I'm like, no, 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 business partner. Yo, dog. I heard you have a partner. Not that I think I could do better. This is in no way to to, to cast aspersions <laughs> on you as a potential. Anyway, the next time we speak to you will be after Christmas. If you celebrate Christmas, have a Merry Christmas. If you celebrated Hanukkah, which ended on the 6th, Happy Hanukkah, albeit belatedly. If you don't celebrate any religiously inspired holidays or any non-religious ho- holidays, have a good seven days. But it is the time when many people celebrate holidays. More power to you if you do. More power to you if you don't. Suffice to say, more power for everyone. So, we're going to talk about board games this week. We're going to mix things up. We're going to talk about the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, the Eurus. We're going to talk about the games we played last week, the news, and why it doesn't matter. And finally, our topic, which is going off script. These are rules explanations or games that cause you to deviate from your standard teaching script and why. So, Walker, what did we review last year? One year ago, like exactly, to the hour. Like I timed it, I wrote it down. Anyway. Watergate, Mark. It's a two-player game, so it doesn't hit the table very much. I don't want to, you know, cast like it's not, wasn't a great game, like we didn't enjoy it a lot, but that field is very limiting, and there's not very often do we get a chance to play games that are only for two players, because even games that are made for more than two players play fine with only two, so getting these two-player only games to the table is nigh impossible. And speaking personally, I've got a pretty big enthusiasm for skirmishy stuff, and card-driven sort of Euro application lends itself naturally to two-player only games, but it thus ends up c- competing directly with the more skirmishy or a lot of the historical con sims or tabletop miniatures games, and thus is a crowded field. That having been said, Watergate, which was designed by Matthias Kramer, I would happily play again. I think it was one of the better Euro instantiations of the sort of card-driven war game element that was introduced in, like, We the People, For the People, etc., etc., Certainly better than a lot of other Euro attempts, like even the good Dr. Knizia in his Blue Moon City, I felt that the card-driven angst of playing a card for its value versus its ops wasn't done particularly well, but Watergate did a good job. I, I Nothing really quite hits the level of Twilight Struggle for me, of really feeling the tension of what am I going to do with this card? When it, as far as multi-use cards are concerned, but Watergate was very, very nice. Sad about the historical theming, though, because the notion of discovering nefarious misdeeds that would lead to the impeachment of a president is completely not anything that makes any sense anymore in 2021. So, shame about that part. But other than that, yeah, Watergate was great. It it covered its theme very well, I thought. You know, it brought in all the different reporters and all the different politicians of the time and sort of, you know, try to you know, work that into the theme and how you're, you know, drawing all the red lines and how everything connected. I thought that part worked out fairly well. Yeah, the spatial aspect of connecting the dots where you have the sort of not quite conspiracy theory pinboard yarn stretching, but rather a sort of, you know, the wire pinboard <laughs> yarn stretching of this is an organization. We're trying to get to the middle and we're working starting the outside. That was really, really well done. And one of the one of the things that I appreciated about the design. As I said, I would happily play Watergate again. Just as as you pointed out very eloquently, it's in a kind of a tough niche. And that is the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. And now on to the games we played this week. Mark, I'm sad to say that Sione Tempore has bit the biscuit. That's good, because then I won't have to hear yet another mispronunciation of that. It is a, a Tempore too far. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that it's just, means. It's, it's just, and neither do I. <laughs> because we read the rule book and we don't even know what anything in the rule book means. And this is the problem, <laughs> right? I think it, it was a Kickstarter that just got out of control type thing. They just added more and more stuff. More and more stuff was not play tested. More and more stuff was not balanced. And I don't know if you saw the huge glut of characters in the game and the fact that there's only one medic. So, you know, if you're not taking that one particular character, like the whole premise is that you're, you know, subbing heroes in and out and taking the ones that are, you know, more apt for certain missions. But if you don't have a healer, wow. you're toast. And there is only one medic in the whole game. And that's all the medic does, we found out. If you bring the medic, that's what that character does. So that's what that player does. They're rolling dice to heal everyone else. And that is not very fun for that person. And just everything else about the combat. And we even threw out the reaction system for the last couple games and it's still 
was just too much of a slog and and too painful of a bad rule book. I'm sad to hear that this was the product of a Kickstarter gotten out of control. It, this is probably the first ever. I know. I, it's very odd. Like usually they lock down on that stuff and you oh, know, yeah. Kickstarter and the community come in and make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen. And I just don't know what happened this time. You know, there was, there were systems in place that failed Mark. We're going to look into it. <laughs> this is a systemic failure. Very much like what led to Watergate. See, it all ties together. <laughs> yeah. It's that red piece of yarn went exactly. from, you know. Nixon, Siona Tempore. I knew it. I knew it had something to do with it. <laughs> Halderman and Ehrlichman designed Siona Tempore, clearly. So <laughs> I look forward to hearing what the next campaign game is going to be, because I know that it is your stren- strenuous desire to always have one running. I'm not saying you have to start it right away. I'm just saying I'm looking forward to, to nope. seeing what you choose we, next. We've sent, we've sent out the list, and we have Seventh Continent, and Gloomhaven, and Reichbusters, and... Others. <laughs> but. <laughs> well, we'll see. And that was Cine Tempora. Walker, we played lots of llama games. Rather, two. A llama-inspired day it was. It's true. We started out with llama dice. This is rapidly becoming one of our favorite fillers, if for no other reason than the joy of the agony of the ecstasy, watching people bust, watching people have a little bit too much hubris. I do enjoy the just seeing the wacky results that come about it. I still wish that there was a little bit more pressure on other players by virtue of the tempo considerations. People actually busting and causing the round to go out that way is somewhat of a rarity. I would rather the tension be a little bit higher if that were increased. Uh, so that was our further experiences with Llama Dice with Rainer Knizia. We'll probably be playing that for quite some time. Also got to try Llama Land by Phil Walker Harding. This is something I've been very interested in trying. Phil Walker Harding also designed Baron Park which is a marvelously simple, marvelously engaging tile-laying game. Based on everything I heard about Llama Land, it sounded like it was going to be another winner. And sure enough, I thoroughly enjoyed Llama Land. Now, it does have a lot of the same simplicity that Baron Park does. In some ways, it's actually simpler than Baron Park, because there's just this pile of tiles that you can take one of your choice, you squash something, and you get everything that you squash. That's more or less it. And you're trying to buy llamas with the resources that you get from squashing things. There's some cards that give you special powers, but they're all very, very simple. And you get them by squashing the special power spot. I don't mean to oversimplify the game, but it really does focus down on this idea of covering things up and building this very interesting sort of spatial tiered element. Because very much like a a, a game from over a decade ago called Toluva by Marcel André Castelmerco. A lot of the game is about trying to navigate the geography of getting to higher levels. Because in Llama Land, you cannot cover up a tile exactly. And so if I put down an L-shaped tile, I can't then put another L directly on top of it. So I have to put something else next to the L-shaped tile, and then I have to use that as the basis for something else that's going to squash that level. Because expanding outward is something you can do, but it's relatively expensive and, and costs you time. That part very much triggered the sort of spatial puzzle elements in my mind that I'm not very good at. And so figuring out the the way to do that most efficiently was something I absolutely could not do. But I didn't really mind all that much because you didn't have to be reminded too much about your dreadful inefficiency. And that's, that actually leads me to one of my other criticisms. This is kind of a double-edged sword. There's less player interaction than in Baron Park. There's less of a pressure than there is in Baron Park. Everyone's going to get to the same place, ultimately, at the end of the game. Everyone's going to place the same number of tiles, the exact same types of tiles, and it's just a question of who ended up buying more llamas, broadly speaking. I mean, yes, there are competitions for the most of a certain kind of llama and the most of something else and chains of llamas, and those things are all good and interesting. But when I play Baron Park, I feel a little bit more time pressure. I feel a little bit more like I need to compete with what my opponent is doing. I feel a little bit more under the gun, and I feel like my park evolves differently as a consequence. And so taken together, I think both Baron Park or Llama Land are excellent tiling games. Great for family-level gaming, I think. Great for approachable intro-level gaming. And they do lead to a lovely little sense of ownership, like a lot of your better tiling games do. It's like, this is my park. This is my collection of llamas. This is the geography that I've staked out for myself. And that's very pleasing and satisfying. But ultimately, I think Baron Park, for me, is slightly preferable, despite the sometimes onerous setup, by virtue of that increased time pressure, a little bit more teeth, no pun intended. I agree with all your points. And like I said, they had that interesting system of of putting your tokens out on the, on the objective cards. And I wish that had played out more of an aggressive stance. I, I'm hoping that 
and in a future expansion, <laughs> they're sort of like pushing markers off and pushing people off, you know, more of a of a vicious competition there. Yes. And I think that would very much make the game way more interesting. I agree, because generally speaking, when you expand outward rather than upwards, you're not getting any resources when you do that, because you're not squashing anything. There are no tablecloth resources in Llama Land that you can get by squashing some of your tablecloth. And as a sort of compensation, you get to put out a scoring marker. Now, in the early part of the game, that's great. You can stake out early territory, and it might help you with a tiebreaker or get you more points, because the goals are very achievable. When you put out a marker to say, I want to claim this goal for the end of the game, they can be done. I'm not saying they're trivial, but it's they can be done relatively easily. So you want those out early. And there's not a whole lot of incentive later on in the game to do some sort of weird maneuver or to take one of your markers and do a late placement or move a marker from one card to the other. And if it were the case that, I don't know, your accomplishing a goal earlier would preclude some other person from accomplishing a goal later or something along those lines that, again, we might see in an expansion, that I think might help introduce that level of, of toothiness, that level of, of direct competition that I miss from Baron Park. And that is Llama Land by Phil Walker Harding, published by Lookout Games. Mark, I got to play G.I. Joe the Deck Builder. It's the new Sentinels. This is designed by T.C. Petty III and put out by Renegade Game Studios. Now, when I ordered said G.I. Joe the Deck Builder, I thought it was going to be yet another IP type game where it's like, here's your favorite cartoon. We put some pictures on a card and made a deck builder out of it. So it was going to, I thought it was going to be, here's a machine gun, pew, pew, you shot, you shot Cobra. Congratulations. I thought they only had lasers. That's true. That's why I said pew, pew and not bang, bang, Mark. Okay. But it is not that, Mark. This is a cooperative deck building game that has some rules grit to it. It is actually kind of interesting. You're you're buying cards, you're going out on missions, you have side missions to do, you have uh, your heroes and your Joes have certain stats, and you actually are rolling dice for successes, and so there's quite a bit to this game, and I'm super happy that it does have more grit than I thought, because it was enjoyed by, we played it today, we played it twice, we enjoyed it so much. It's a great little deck building game. I can't wait to show it to you for sure. I remember they all had pets and, they didn't, and stuff no, they like didn't that. They all but, had pets. Uh, there was the sailor no. guy with the parrot. And in point of fact, that's there was a, a plot arc involving him where he was captured and subjected to gaslighting and mind alteration. And he started hallucinating. I, I remember being freaked out by that series arc as, as a child. There was a fantastic robot chicken skit about them all having pets, Mark. So obviously, <laughs> robot chicken would not lie. Uh, yeah, something about that. Sure. I know that there's also a Transformers deck building game by Renegade Games put out at the same time. I am interested in trying that. And in fact, I'm affronted by your, your lack of enthusiasm for Transformers. It's true. Well, I had to pick one, Mark. And we had a few Transformers and and Macross games recently, and G.I. Joe is a totally new IP that I have not seen yet, so I went with the G.I. Joe. But this is so good that I am, you know, 90% on board of picking up the Transformers one as well. All right, then. I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm usually down for even a mediocre co-op deck builder, so I look forward to trying it. I got to try Assault on Doomrock Ultimate Edition. This is a prototype that was sent to us by the designer Tom Stasiak at Beautiful Disaster. Assault on Doomrock is one of my favorite fantasy co-op adventure games. Lots of goofy humor, lots of grim gallows humor, lots of dice rolling, lots of very interesting spatially abstract combat. This is a game that focuses primarily on the combat system. The adventure prelude is mostly just trying to gear up for the exploding tomatoes or the zombies or the hordes of bunnies that will surely eviscerate you in short order because it has well earned its status as a legendarily difficult game. I think I've only won it once legit and once more cheating slightly. Anyway, so Ultimate Edition is something that's going to be crowdfunded next year. And there are things that are new in the Ultimate Edition. One of them is just more stuff. More professions, more cards, more traits, more of, of, of all the things you love. And to that end, I can say that I'm a huge, huge fan of the more stuff in Assault on Doomrock Ultimate Edition. I played with new heroes and new traits, and I... Air, I, I sort of skewed towards new skills and new monster encounters, and I have to say that the level of quality has maintained consistent throughout. And 
many people are asking the important question, well, t tell us a little bit more about some of these professions while well, I played as a Viking. And, of course, everyone wants to know about the hist historicity of Vikings. Was it presented historically accurate? Well, I say, well, it's one step forward, one step back. The step back is they are represented as having horns on their helmets, which we all know is not historically accurate. But fortunately, uh, the historical accuracy is burnished by the fact that these are Vikings that shoot lasers from their eyes, which we all know is historically accurate. So good for the research and fidelity on the part of the Doomrock history team. And then there's all a whole bunch of optional modules. One of them is custom dice. Abilities now, instead of giving you a generic die, give you a ability color-coded die. Some of them let you gain stealth. Some of them are more apt to give you defensive abilities. Some of them are more apt to give you offensive abilities. And some of them give you conditional rerolls. So, for example, an attack die, a die that comes from an attack skill is going to let you re-roll all your fours at the end of your dice rolling because attack skills don't trigger off of fours. And so this die doesn't have to go to the skill that generated the die, but it is more likely to give you the results that can trigger attack dice. The downside of this die is that it can never give you defensive abilities. You can't get shields from attack dice. And so there's an interesting trade-off there in terms of how your character is going to develop, and that in turn influences how your skills are acquired. There are also a whole bunch of other optional modules which I did not try yet, uh, news on those later. And all of this is subject to development and change, but I will say the following about Assault on Doomrock Ultimate Edition. A lot of the component changes so far are good. The location cards, one of the common criticisms of Doomrock was that the location cards were too small because the entire party decides collectively on what you're going to do during the adventure phase at various locations. And because they were standard sized cards, it was difficult for everyone around the table to see what was going on. They are now real big, and they in the they plan on in the published edition keeping them real big. This is definitely an advance. Still just deciding by committee, but at least now the committee all gets to read from the same easily visible group of notes. All these enhancements though, and a number of other subtle changes are on the margins, are contributing to a certain amount of component creep. And this is particularly relevant for me because when I'm playing a co-op game or when I'm playing an adventure game solo, I don't like having to manage that many components. It's just an example of how the component creep is working, even without any of the optional modules. It used to be the case that when you were generating peril, which is a consequence of travel or certain encounters, you would pull from the encounter decks. The encounter decks serve double duty. They would both generate peril and would generate encounters from uh, for certain locations. This is no longer the case. You now have a separate in peril die. There's also a new deck of cards for secrets, which can modify various locations. And this is, bef again, before you get into the optional modules. And if you start playing with any of the optional modules, that's usually another deck of cards or another group of dice or another group of tokens and a variety of other things. And so what we're getting to is a certain level of component creep that I'm not a huge fan of. It's still worth it. I'm, I'm very, very happy that I was able to tinker around with the new stuff in Assault on Doomrock. And I look forward to the published version very, very much. And I'm going to be playing this prototype another couple of times, no doubt, because of my enthusiasm for Doomrock. But I am concerned about whether all of these optional modules are going to be able to pull their own weight in terms of the component creep and the rules creep, just being able to access everything and manage everything on the table. And so those are my early experiences with Assault on Doomrock Ultimate Edition. I remain a massive Doomrock fan. And more to follow, specifically about some of the other rules changes, like terrain, like the solo variants, like the pets, etc., etc. There's lots to explore here. And so that is Assault on Doomrock Ultimate Edition by Tom Stasiak at Beautiful Disaster Games. It definitely feel sounds like it's approaching that, you know, open the box and I'm not sure which modules or what variants or what extra stuff we're going to play with today. Maybe we'll just close the box and play something else. It's definitely not that bad. It's definitely not getting to the level where it's like, well, which game mode do we want? Well, if we want this game mode, we need this board and we need to modify the rules from the base game in this following way. Or this other module requires other modifications. It's not quite at that level. So I'm not concerned there. I'm just a little bit concerned about the the ergonomics overall. So we streamed a couple games again this Saturday. The first one was Wingspan. It's the new Lahav. This is designed by Elizabeth Hardgrave and published by Stonemeyer Games. And it won a couple of awards, Mark, in case you didn't hear. One or two, yeah. What you're doing in Wingspan is that you have a goal card at the beginning and you're playing these birds and they require certain 
uh, recipes to play them out. And they can only go in certain habitats and those habitats correspond to actions. And when you use those actions, it triggers the birds that are in that row if they have a triggering action and they let you do extra stuff. So it is definitely one of these games where it's like, well, I want to do this, but if I do this now, I don't have this component that will help me trigger this bird. So I need to do this other action first. So it does have a lot of decision space in there. And the fact that there are other birds that let you get more goal cards so you can sort of cycle through more and and there's so many different ways to score points like tucking cards in behind birds or putting out eggs or or leaving food out on the birds there's lots of different combos and there's so many expansions now that there are so many birds and we played with all of the expansions and so the newest expansion gives you new boards and a new resource, which is nectar, which spoils at the end of every turn. So you have to use it right away, but it's wild. You can use it for anything. And not only that, when you do use it for something, it goes into that column of action. And that will be more scoring at the end of the game as well. Whoever used the most nectar in those certain actions. All in all, usually we have a great time playing Wingspan. This was no different. And uh, if you want to check it out, it's on the YouTubes. Played a game of Factory Funner. This is the second edition put out by Board Game Tables this year. Factory Funner was initially published five years ago by Quali, and Factory Funner in turn was a sequel to Factory Fun, which was published 10 years before that. So we're now actually talking about a 15-year-old game system, which is kind of impressive. And Factory Funner is very much a game for people who like to connect things with pipes. Something occurred to me, though, during this playing of Factory Funner, and I'll, I'll, I'll then talk about the specifics of this new edition by Board Game Tables. It's a lot like the running a company elements of 18xx, albeit simplified to the nth degree. Because Factory Funner is extremely approachable. You get this tile, it'll get you some number of money, you just got to make sure that all connections work out. And the more connections you need to put out in order for this thing to function properly, the less money you're going to get. So it's very approachable in that sense, because even if you play it like a monkey, as I do, you're going to be able to put out these tiles. You're going to be able to turn a profit. It's just you're going to be reliably turning a profit of one to two dollars, while the tryhard next to you, who can actually spatially reason worth a damn, is going to be earning six or seven dollars every time they put down a tile. The reason why I, I would compare this actually favorably to some of the elements of running a company in 18xx, and I can already hear the angst of the train gamers objecting to any implication that their precious games are in any way similar to a game of such simplicity and such accessibility, is that you can get things done while playing like a monkey. I am getting my connections there, and I'm just not making much money, as opposed to an 18xx game where it's like, no, 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 you can't get to Chicago, that tile doesn't exist in the supply, or you're out of tokens, or you only get to do the two tile placement actions this turn, you need the special ability to get the third tile placement and or an upgrade. So, suffice to say, even somebody who's no good at these types of games, even someone, I dare say, who does not enjoy these kinds of spatial connection games of, here's a hex grade, connect A to B in the best way possible, you can still get some progress and not feel like a total maroon, independently of the fact that you just know from background information. Repeated reminders from your co-host and or parental background that you're a total maroon. Factory Funner, therefore, lets you still build the thing. Now, about the new edition. I very much prefer the new edition to the older edition for two reasons. Number one, the box is delightfully small and yet packed to the brim with goodies. And number two, it's, to my tastes, more visually appealing. I quite like the artwork on the new tile connectors. They're very charming without getting in the way of usability at all. And I very much appreciate that Board Game Tables lately has been putting out a series of games, namely this edition of Factory Funner, as well as Kabuto Sumo, as well as QE, as well as upcoming games as well, that all share the same size factor, but unlike, you know, your standard Ticket to Ride box, or even like a standard long box that P.D. Verlag often uses that's kind of sort of the same shape and size as, as Hasbro boxes. This is a relatively small box. I was actually surprised that you can still play six players and each player has a mounted board and it's a very, very small box size. Anyway, I kind of appreciate that. I, I, I think it's cool if you're able to line up a whole bunch of games by the same publisher and all the same size and shape, but it's not so big that it then dominates your shelf. Anyway, I kind of appreciate that element. So this was a review copy sent to us by Board Game Tables and the new edition is available in 2021. This is Factory Funner by Corne von Morsel. Yeah, that is definitely a game that has survived the culling. I do have the second edition. I guess this would be the third edition. Or was it or was it Factory Fun? And then I got the first edition of Factory Funner. And then they kickstarted. And then there was the reprint. <laughs> you have, to the best of my understanding, the second printing of the first edition 
of Factory Funner, the one put up by Quality. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So it's Survive the Colony. I do enjoy that type of game. It's very much like an app game. There's lots of apps out there that have this sort of feeling of of puzzling out how to connect things because you're very limited to where only one pipe can get, come out per hex side. So there's very much a puzzle element. And once you're all done, it, it looks very interesting as well. Very fun game. The visual appeal is undeniable. I'm a little bit disappointed that there's not more real-time element. I certainly wouldn't want to have to build my factory in real-time, but there's this real-time element of grabbing the tile you want to place, and then everyone goes off to the shepherd boards and does their own multiplayer solitaire kind of deal. Which, quite frankly, given that it's a spatial puzzle, is kind of okay if you're going to do multiplayer solitaire. I would rather it be this kind of thing where everyone's managing their little boards. And you do get the visual appeal of seeing everyone else's factories evolve, because there's something so undeniably charming about seeing these weird machines linked together with an absurd concoction and tangle of pipes. It's very physically attractive, and that's one of the reasons why I very much approve the new artwork of the the, the Board Game Tables edition of Factory Funner. So look, this is not a kind of game I enjoy. This is not a kind of game I would ever request. But for somebody who wants to play this kind of thing, Factory Funner is absolutely my preferred poison. So the second game we streamed was Ethnos. It's New El Grande. (laughs) Uh, This is designed by Paolo Mori, published by Simon Games. So Ethnos is a great game because there's all these different factions and you're only using a small subset of them every game. So you're creating all these different combinations and your turns are very simple. You're either playing a card or you're drawing a card and you're either drawing from the top of the deck or you're drawing from a pool of cards of which are created at the beginning of every round, or when someone finally plays a set of cards, and they can either be a set of factions or a set of colors, then they have to discard all of their leftover cards that don't match that particular faction or that particular color. And so it leads to great situations and huge decision space and interesting stuff that's happening on the board because you're playing these factions out because there's a an area control game going on the board where there's all these different lands and they put out random uh, scoring opportunities every game. So they're going to be worth different amount of points, depending on what round you're in all sorts of fun stuff, trolls, minotaurs, centaurs, fairies, skeletons, all sorts of stuff. Ethnos always want to play it. Well, anytime you're at the table, there's going to be trolls represented Walker. Wow. Orc board. Yeah, so there are two cultural things that have developed uh, amongst the swag playings of Ethnos. One of them is Orc Board, which we just enjoy saying over and over and over again, because if you play with the Orcs, there's a separate board. And the other is the game is so quick. When you're playing Ethnos, your turns are so quick, and you only ha- you can choose between doing one of two things. You either play a card or draw a card. And so... We very frequently played five or six player games, and if someone has the temerity to take more than half a second to consider their turn, we start bullying them by chanting while pounding on the table, play or draw, play or draw. Which is unfair of us, because the game is still quick, even if people bother to to slow down to think. We just enjoy the chanting and the bullying, what can I say? It's true. We don't watch sports, so we have to find our chanting and bullying impulses somewhere. Exactly. We We have to sing about something. Played Undaunted Reinforcements. Reinforcements is the latest expansion to the Undaunted line. Undaunted Normandy and Undaunted North Africa by Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson. This expansion is designed by those latter two, as well as David Digby and David Tsertse, because they decided only one David wasn't enough. And now they need three Davids and a Trevor in order to design Undaunted Reinforcements. It's a somewhat unusual expansion in that it has material for both of the previous games at the same time. So there are some new scenarios for North Africa, there's new scenarios for Normandy, there's also new units for each of them, but they're not cross-compatible. There's also the solo mode, and that's where David Sertze comes along, because of course if you're going to have a solo mode, got to be by David Sertze. Now, first off, in terms of the new units, I very much like them. One of the things that is a significant change, I played a new Normandy scenario, and now armor has been introduced into Normandy. There were no vehicles in Undaunted Normandy, there were vehicles in Undaunted North Africa, but they've introduced vehicles, specifically tanks, into Undaunted Normandy, and they do not work the same way as they do in North Africa. In point of fact, they just work like normal units, with the minor exception that they cannot be damaged except by other tanks. Works out just fine. It leads to a very interesting dynamic 
whereby at the start of a scenario, if both sides have mixed forces, you have to w consider about what to do in terms of tempo and timing and risk, because the only troops that can actually pursue your victory conditions are, as a general rule, your rifle units. Your rifle units who are very vulnerable to these tanks, but spending all your time moving your tanks and upgrading your tanks and getting more tank cards, that's not actually progressing you towards victory. But by the same token, if near the mid game or near the end game, you have tanks on the board and your opponent doesn't, well then, tarps off boys, you're, prob you're probably going to do pretty well at blocking their rifles from taking any victory points if they haven't already managed to snag it already. Because again, there's this timing element. You may be too busy trying to maintain arbor superiority while all the while your opponent's actually grabbing the victory condition positions. Anyway, I found that trade-off to be really, really interesting in the one scenario that I played. And I've commented before that in the Undaunted series, sometimes the scenarios are really good, sometimes the scenarios are, shall we say, less good and don't show the system to its strengths. Because I adore the fundamental deck building at the core of the Undaunted system. I absolutely love it. The way that every bid for initiative is so important, the way that every card you add to your deck is important for both tempo considerations as well as movement considerations as well as casualty considerations, deciding what to attack, who to attack, when to use them, etc., etc. Love the Undaunted series, and if this scenario that I tried is any indication, the scenario design in Reinforcements has the potential to really play with these new toys in interesting ways. I also played Solo. Here's the thing. I'm not generally a huge fan of David Tertze's solo work. I don't really like his the way he designs solo systems. The one exception that I keep coming back to is his solitaire system for Anachrony, which I think is actually really, really good. I don't know why his relatively complicated, somewhat overblown, over-chromed worker placement game ended up having the really simple to apply solitaire system, whereas when he designed solitaire systems for other games, the worst defender of this case, I think, actually is Blitzkrieg World War II in 20 Minutes by Paolo Mori, which takes an incredibly simple game and turns the solitaire system into a very complicated, convoluted mess, in my estimation. So I was a little bit worried for Undaunted about what he was going to do to this incredibly simple, quick, visceral system with his solitaire designs. I have seen better from David Cersei. I've also seen worse. Basically, the way this solitaire system works is you have to spend a fair amount of additional time for setup about where, th where the various solitaire system cards are, and then each unit gets an AI card. And you pull the AI card, you look at the, the, the flowchart, and you look to see what the thing does. This is a flowchart, not the level of complication of your standard consim bots. So fans of Volko Rinke games know what I'm talking about, any of his designs, any of the coin games, with these incredibly convoluted nested conditionals, they're not that bad. Usually it's a, for, for rifles, for example, it's a three-step process. Can they take control of an objective? No? Well, okay, then they'll try to go towards taking control of an objective. Oh, they can't do that either? Well, then okay, they'll try to kill something. So I'm oversimplifying, and you do have to worry about who they're targeting, and every scenario has its own hierarchy, of which unit is considered more dangerous at whatever time, and that can occasionally be a little bit cumbersome. So that's not ideal. Is it better than not being able to play Undaunted at all? Absolutely. I'm a big, big fan of Undaunted. I'm a big fan of the work of Trevor, Trevor Benjamin and of David Thompson. I don't really know a whole lot about David Digby, but his work seems to be solid if reinforcements is an indication. And I very much also appreciate the physical design of the expansion in that it is a big box that can store all the material from both Undaunted Normandy and Undaunted North Africa. So the worst case scenario would have been three boxes, right? You'd have your North Africa box, your Normandy box, and then your reinforcements box. So being able to replace it all with one box is very, very much appreciated. There's also a four-player mode, which I haven't tried. And then there's Osprey Games itself. So... I really like Osprey games. I like a lot of their tabletop miniatures rule systems. I, I very much enjoyed Brian Boru. I am a huge fan of Imperium, both classics and legends. And then there's what they've done with Undaunted Reinforcements. Out of the box, there are serious, serious component problems. One of them is that the card backs for the expansion cards are really different from the base game cards. The claim is from the company that this depends on what printing of the base games you got. I'm not sure to what extent I'd buy that because I have not heard accounts from anybody who has the base game box that match the expansion material well, either in terms of cut or color. And the Undaunted series, it really matters whether or not you can tell from someone's hand whether they have an expansion card in their hand or a base game card in their hand. It will influence how you bid, it influence who you attack, it influence how you maneuver. It's a big, big deal. The other big problem is, is that out of the box, most of the solitaire scenarios are not playable because of very serious typos in the solitaire cards. 
there is an errata. You can go download the, the document, but then that, that's another thing you have to go and reference on top of the fact that now you've got a mountain of rule books to page through. This is a little bit like my concerns about Doom Rock. In Undaunted, you have two rule books for every game in the system. And sometimes I would forget what rule, rule book I needed to go look through in order to find the answer to my question. Is this a question about the fundamental solitaire system itself, in which case it's in one rule book? Is it in the solo rulebook? No, no, no. The solo rulebook only has information about solo applications for previous scenarios. I needed the scenario rulebook for reinforcements because all the solo information for the reinforcement scenarios is in the reinforcement book. The rules for the solo system are not in the solo rulebook. The rules for the solo system are in the reinforcements base game rulebook. So that's a little bit my problem and a little bit of an organization problem. And I don't know if there would have been an easy way to make this incredibly straightforward. But suffice to say that there's a lot of excellent design work in here that is being hobbled somewhat uh, by very serious component problems. Now, Osprey Games is going to have a replacement system whereby they are going to send out to all affected users every single card from North Africa, Normandy, and reinforcements so that all the cards will match. I suspect this is going to cost them what could be charitably described as a lot of money. I went and signed up today. You can find a link to it on BoardGameGeek. You can find it on the Osprey website. They're also going to send out corrected versions of all the solitaire cards. But this is an unfortunate misstep. This is already a little bit of a downer on my ability to appreciate the product as it is, and as a huge fan of the system, I was somewhat disappointed. It's manageable. It's absolutely manageable, but it's a shame that you have to. Anyway, I'm looking forward to going through the rest of this material. I want to try the four-player mode. I want to try more solo scenarios. I want to try more scenarios, both from Normandy and North Africa, with the new reinforcement stuff. I'm a big fan of the content. I just wish that it had been presented in a slightly more professional way. So that is Undaunted Reinforcements by Trevor Benjamin, David Digby, D David Thompson, and David Zertze, put out this year by Osprey Games. Yeah, I think they lost an opportunity there, right? If they're bringing out a box that fits everything, why they did not rewrite the book like one overall book that has all of the rules so then you're not like you said flipping through five different manuals trying to find the rules i would have settled for a comprehensive reference sheet that tells you what all the various actions do because as you can recall from undaunted you play a card and every unit was just has a list of actions that it can perform but now it's the case again where i play a card and it says it can do a certain kind of action like I remember what Scout does, I remember what Control does, but sometimes I don't remember exactly how Inspire works, or sometimes I don't know how Rally works, or I forget exactly how the Mortar system works. Now, some of those new actions are explained in one rulebook, some of those old actions are explained in other rulebooks, I just would have liked some sort of reference that summarized all the available actions based on theater. That would have been very helpful. I... As for the rule books, I don't know if there's a simple or cost-effective way to make it more comprehensible. Very much like a lot of systems, sometimes even very simple systems start to sprawl. But there are things you can do to help mitigate that, like player aids. It's true. So I got to play Bitoku. It's the new Gugong. This is designed by <laughs> German P. Millen and put out by Devier Games. You're going to kill me, Walker. So... This was the sweetheart of the the big German convention. Everyone was talking about that while the convention was going on. It was a beautiful, very colorful art, you know, out of this world. It looks fantastic. And it has this very interesting, like, sort of three-stage action thing you do. I'm not going to go over everything you get to do in Botoku, but the actions you can do are playing cards or playing dice, which, you know, these are all things I love, Mark. I love deck building and I love dice worker placement where you get to upgrade the dice. You get to do all of these things. So like I was saying, you're either playing cards, playing dice, or the dice get to advance across the river, which triggers another action. But these also all have to come in stages because you can't use your dice right away because they're locked. And there's other ways to unlock them, but the main way to unlock them is to play a card. So usually you have to play a card first, that unlocks one die, and then you could either unlock your second die or bring that first die out because when you cross the river, there's very limited spaces. So you're trying to get your dice out there quickly because you want to, you know, make sure you get that third stage of action before everybody else does, before they all fill up. And you're getting dragonflies and you're getting these spirit cards and you're going on these, these paths, tons going on. Very interesting. The artwork, I loved every part of it. Loved the game. Can't wait to play it again. Only got to play it once. This is another, another, you know, bonus points combination, you know, points, points and more points, <laughs> but still, because when you play the dice out, it matters what how it's what power it is it will tell you what kind of action you get to take when you put it out and not only that 
there's all these different buildings that you're going to be building on these action spots. And then depending on what the number is, it'll let you know what building you can activate. But you claim the building. So if you use someone else's building, they'll get a bonus. So it's, it has all these different, you know, sort of interlocking systems that make the game super fun. Padoku. Do the combos end up alienating the rest of the table like some of your more elaborate combo systems tend to do sometimes? No, it doesn't. It Good. does not take that long to go through a combo. Good, glad to hear it. Looking forward to trying it. Yeah, it's a huge wall. Like it's one of these things where once you start playing it, it is quite obvious. But like I said, trying to get through all of these subsystems, it's like it's very you know graph straight up. <laughs> sure. All right. Second crunchy game I got to play is called Gutenberg. It's the new Praga. This is designed by Karzania Korlich and. Wolkchek Winski, and it's published by Grana Games. And what this one is is sort of like a typeset game. Mark, you know, you're you know, you're putting in your letters and you're, you know, sh- shimmying your ink back and forth, and you're creating, you know, the first newsprint. Oh, so this is not Steve Gutenberg. No, oh, that's disappointing. Who's Steve Gutenberg, Mark? I don't know. What what does Gutenberg have to do with the first movable typeset in Europe? I, I don't know. You think I look into this stuff? You think I'm some sort of a professional or something? <laughs> God. So you have your you have your vowels there. You have uh, A, E, I, and O. No U? No. Wait a second. No E. Just a second. Let me do that again. You have A, E, O, and U. And then you say no, no E. No E's allowed, Mark. Never Y. Just those four. Must, I'm sure it has to do something about, you know, gameplay, and they only need a certain number of letters. Wait, 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 wait. One of the vowels is just gone? Yes, no E and no Y either. Okay. I'm sure there is there is some sort of theme in that book. We played this on Tabletop Simulator, so I didn't get the full experience because they're, they have this whole gear system that's, that's fairly interesting. It's the hook, kind of. You uh, are going to be able to purchase these gears, and they go on your own personal player board, and there's three slots they go on. And at a certain point in the game, you're going to be able to turn them. So the one will turn counterclockwise, which will cause the other one to turn counterclockwise and so on and so forth. So these three gears will turn in their different directions and they'll line up with whatever special abilities they get that turn. There's one blank side and the two other sections have different abilities. So you're like planning out how they're going to turn. That part is interesting. The other part that is is interesting. It's sort of a recipe fulfillment. It's like someone comes in, I would like you to print this. And you sort of like, ah, I could print that. No problem. You want A, A, E, E, O. No problem. <laughs> you, but you said there can, are no E's. Print, How can you print it? That? Sorry, sorry. You, sorry, sorry, sorry. You want A, E, O, and U. No problem. I you said E again. U. Doesn't matter. Stop being so picky. I'm all just, right. And then he'll say, I'm well. I'm still reeling. I can't say, understand. That's, that's they'll, all. They'll say, they'll say, hey, could you, could you do some of those, some of those letters in red? And you'll go, uh, maybe I'll do them in red. <laughs> And he's like, but they want, I want the use to be kind of fancy. Yeah, we'll see <laughs> if we have time for that, right? Because because the orders come in two parts. So you have the letters that they want, and then you'll have uh, like a combination of maybe colors and or, you know, chisel symbols or all sorts of things. And so you have, you have, and they leave it open to you. So you can just fulfill it with just the letters and that's fine. You'll get some points. And then the bottom part, you can use some of the inks or some of the typefacing or some of the things, and it's all open for you. You know, they're not going to lock you out of the whole thing if you can't do parts of it. They'll give you points for the things you can do. And then if you happen to do all of the bottom card, then you'll get a, another bonus on top of that. So I, le- I like how they leave it open. And it really, like I can see where if they made it, an all or nothing thing, then you would just say, you know, forget about it. But the fact that they leave it so open, you just try to push that further mm. to get those two other things. Like, and, and I just felt as though you normally wouldn't do that, but because, you know, that it's so open, it just leads you to want to do it that much more for whatever reason. There's all sorts of other things going on. I'm not going to cover, but it's very interesting. One more other thing I'll cover is that you're going to go down this big list of actions that go down. It's like increasing your, you know, getting you know, different colored inks, getting more contracts, all these different actions you can do. And depending on the player order, you're going to get a certain number of cubes and you're secretly going to put them on the different actions. And that will, that will be the turn order for each of those actions. So it's kind of interesting how you can manipulate those cubes because there's, you can put none on some of the actions and you won't even be able to get to do it. But as long as you have at least one cube, then you can do, you could be doing it last, but at least you'll be able to do it. All sorts of 
interesting things going on in Gutenberg. I see the potential for a celebrity-endorsed expansion to introduce the missing vowel. That would make the game more approachable and a little less difficult. They could call it the Easy E expansion. So so true. And this, the I looked, I looked it up because, like I said, I played the TTS version. I did look it up. This, the production on this is like off the hook, ridiculous. Like the type letters are actually raised. They're act like actual sort of like type setting sure. letters. It comes with all these different tuck boxes in the box, and then on top of that, there's the gears that go on your personal player board. Very nice looking. Looking forward to playing it in real life if I can ever find a copy and. Gutenberg. I actually saw a Gutenberg Bible at the Beinecke Rare Book Museum, which was one of the most powerful experiences I ever had. Not so much the Gutenberg Bible, but I was actually able to sit in front of a first edition, first printing of the Critique of Pure Reason, and uh, that affected me deeply. Did it have any ease, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> to the best of my understanding, it did. And those are the games we played this week. Now on to the news and why it does not matter. A little bit of follow-up from last week. We talked about how Kickstarter was trying to expand into the blockchain for reasons in an attempt to clarify their position. Kickstarter has helpfully released a fact in which they've tried to explain their reasons. And they've said that the reason why they're going to the blockchain is because it will be better for everybody. For reasons... Suffice to say, the backlash has continued. A number of creators are continuing to announce that they don't plan on working with Kickstarter anymore going forward. A number of Kickstarter updates I have received personally are from creators saying, well, we're kind of locked into doing these next few projects through Kickstarter, but after that, we're not really so keen. By the way, have you heard of GameFound? So this is a developing story, and who knows where it's going to end up. In other news... There's going to be an upcoming game from Remo Consadori and one of our favorite European designers, Paolo Mori, called Fairy Tale Inn. This is going to be a two-player game which looks an awful lot like Connect 4, but with special powers and some interesting placement rules. I am looking forward to giving it a try when it comes out. Walker is indicating with a technical broadcasting term known as the stink face that he is not interested, but I have a great deal of faith in Paolo Mori. I, I saw it. And I'm looking on my notes here. I don't seem to have written anything about it. I wonder why that is. <laughs> Your face certainly told a story uh, a moment ago, Walker. <laughs> so last week was a episode number divisible by five, and we never talked about our Patreon, Mark. So we're going to talk about it today. Hey, everyone, we have a Patreon. Mark does a ton of work on the Patreon, all sorts of updates and newsletters and extra segments. We do our kick track, sort of where we talk about the, the Kickstarters of the week. And just this week, Mark, we have started the Patreon-only Discord server, so I have not ever participated in any Discord sort of message boards, so this is a venture for myself as well. It was an interesting day today trying to figure out the clickety-clacks, but it seems to be well-received, so check it out. And on our Discord server, you can use the letter E. It's true. More fancy than a Gutenberg movable type printing press. So I've heard. I think by now many people have seen the news that Asmodee has been sold to a Swedish company called Embracer. This is a video game holding company, and it was sold for 2.75 billion euros, which is, again, this is a technical term, a whole lot of money. And this is despite the fact that the initial asking price or initial expected price was somewhere more in the neighborhood of 2 billion euros rather than 2.75, so that's a big deal. But honestly, for me as a consumer... I was actually more shook by the news that sometime over the course of the past year, Asmodee purchased e-tailer and brick-and-mortar game retailer Miniature Market. And this was kind of sort of revealed as an aside during a business presentation about other news. So there was no announcement. It happened a while ago. We don't know exactly when, and we don't know exactly why. It just kind of happened. You mean a gaming distributor owning its own brick-and-mortar store could cause problems? I uh, Yeah. Question mark? Call me an insane conspiracy theorist. Of course, vertical integration will bring us nothing but profit. I mean, pleasure. I mean, something. Uh, again, it will be good for consumers for reasons. Anyway, I, I was shook by this because Miniature Market was one of my go-to retailers back when I lived in the United States. Because if you're the kind of person who plays Euro games and historical consims and tabletop miniatures games and, 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 and... Uh, you know, a place that's going to carry all the latest Infinity stuff as well as a whole bunch of board games is is not easy to come by. But uh, this is definitely making me reconsider a lot of my <laughs> economic choices in the increasing monolith. Now, the good news is, 
looking over uh, the, the list of the top games, at least as far as our favorite games of the coming year, because we're kind of sort of thinking about our end of year spectacular. But a lot of those releases are not from any Asmodee companies. And that, I think, is is at least some good news, because despite the fact that they keep acquiring company after company after company, there are a lot of quality non-Asmodee releases. But that's not for lack of trying. <laughs> so who knows where this is going to end up. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now on to our topic for the week, which is going off script. So this is a segment that's going to be about we have, or Mark definitely has, I have been trying to implement a certain cadence to explaining rules, like a sort of a mental checklist that you go through in order to make the game more presentable, to make sure you cover all the bases, to when you are explaining rules to the same people sort of over and over again, they come to expect a certain cadence and then they can, you know, absorb the information better when they sort of understand the way you're going to present this information. Absolutely. I mean, part of this comes from the fact that I'm a Kantian. Kantians love to systematize knowledge. It's kind of our thing. Uh, we didn't, you know, we certainly didn't invent it, but it's certainly characteristic of a, of a lot of the ways that, uh, that Kantianism has in influenced my actual day-to-day -day life. And it's also just so I remember things. Like, I process rules in a certain way, and I try to communicate that in, in a certain consistent way. And I don't know if it necessarily helps with people's internalization of certain rules, but it certainly helps me remember things. The other thing that I find impressive and rather striking is if you actually sit down to think about how much of our hobby, hobby time is actually spent explaining and learning new rules, even if you're not slavishly devoted to the cult of the new, it represents a lot of your hobby time. And it's actually... Rather I, I've learned that recently, Mark. For some reason in this last year, I've learned <laughs> all about rereading rule books and teaching. And I don't know why, but yes, I, I've, I've lived that story. And it's strange. It's not like it's a year. secret. It's not like it's a taboo topic. It's not like nobody talks about teaching games and learning games. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about it compared to how much time we actually spend doing it. Uh, which actually, for what it's worth, mirrors my experience in academia teaching professionally. You know, it's something that would occupy a large quantity of our time, but we spend vanishingly little time talking about how to do it well. So I guess it's hardly novel in the hobby context. Anyway, so to that end, I figured I'd spend a very, very little bit of time talking about my standard sort of structure of explaining a game. Walker can chime in about how he does things differently, if at all. And then we'll talk about those circumstances where we might be inclined to deviate. So... Usually I start with how you win. I, I, I tend to focus on victory conditions, and so I present them first, even if out of context you're not going to understand them. It tends to color things later. How a round looks, what you do when it's your turn, any sort of miscellany that is not immediately covered by what you do during your turn, and then finally, what triggers the end game and what scoring you do at the end game. And then if necessary, sometimes I then recapitulate how one wins, if that has not already been recapitulated by discussing the end game. I usually reach over and hit the play button, and when the video stops, I hit the stop button. <laughs> but you don't tell people to go watch video explanations, Walker. You do give rules explanations. No, I know. I do. I'm only joking. I And then after, first thing you do, I want to make sure to make this very clear. The first thing you do is you complain about how bad the rule book oh, is. Oh, sure to everyone and so they understand that it's not your fault if you get something wrong it's actually how bad the rule book I is. usually save that for the first rules question that I can't immediately answer if I have to go look something up which is which is I'll then complain about how bad the rules are while looking it up which is funny because I, I forgot to talk about that when I was talking about uh, G.I. Joe the deck building game where the rule book is quite atrocious oh, sure. where it talks about certain things and, you know, in most deck builders where it has just the common deck that you can choose from, it doesn't even tell you about that in setup. It was like in some subset rule near the back of the book where it says, oh, by the way, that's what these cards are for, which is terrible because there's one big deck that you're going to draw from to, you know, create the pool. And all it says in setup is put out the general sure. deck. Which is fine if you've played before, <laughs> but if you're opening this game, if if you open this game up and all of the cards are together, and it you it doesn't tell you how many cards are in this general deck or what the general cards are, you're just sort of guessing, and especially when it doesn't tell you about these other cards that you're supposed to. Anyway. It's interesting you point that out, though, because that's one of those areas which is very much off script necessarily, which is the setup information. 
The rules explainer will, of course, usually hand some hand something to somebody and say, "Shuffle this," or "Put these tokens out in this very in this specific place." But as far as just understanding how the game is set up, that is usually not something you get from a rules explanation. Very often, you can be taught the game quite expertly and play the game even competently, but then you're not necessarily in a position to go teach the game right away because you don't know how to set the thing up. True. And one thing I like to do is I. I... Sometimes it's really nice when the theme sort of helps with the flow of yes. the game. And this is not always the case. Sometimes it's just sort of pasted on, as mm -hmm. they say, or in the background. But it is nice when the theme sort of propels the flow of the game. So you can sort of reference it or, you know, sort of explain it in that way. So it just sort of makes it all mesh together. That's actually one of the areas where I'm extremely deficient. And I acknowledge this very openly in rules explanations, I very often neglect to mention what the theme of the game is at all. Now, sometimes this isn't a problem. Sometimes this is because the theme is literally incomprehensible, like Raw. The theme of Raw makes no sense. I mean, there's no theme of Raw. It's just like, here's some Egyptian stuff that happens. Okay. Then there's times when the theme is utterly irrelevant because it's so incredibly banal, like Hansa Teutonica. Like, who, who's like, we're all German merchants in the Hanseatic League. Like, who cares? Uh, sometimes, though, I, I would argue that themes the games are thematic, but I just let the theme of the game speak for itself in terms of how things develop. Sometimes I lean on this too much. Now, there are exceptions. There are games where I do actually spend some time, either at the beginning or throughout the rest of the rules explanation, trying to lean on what the theme of the game is so as to enhance the experience of the people at the table. The different thing that I do from yours is is I try to give a very brief overview of the game Uh at the very beginning, just sort of said, yeah, this is a deck builder. We're going to be buying cards from here. We're going to be putting them over here. And then we're going to go to an end phase. And then we're going to do yeah, this. Yeah, but that's not thematic. we do though. that six times. No, no, that's nothing to do with theme. I just said, this is how the, our two things oh, sure. differ is what I was going to say. And then I try to say, you know, I try to explain if there's a certain hook in the game or the one part, you know, interesting, like I always say, the one interesting part or... Or I'll say something like, this is the actual game part where this is all just, you know, nothing. <laughs> this is just, you know, the you know the silly part or the stuff that is so basic it, it doesn't need to be talked about. But this part over here, you know, where we're going to interact with this thing, this is going to be the actual decision space and the actual part that's going to matter. Sure. Could you give me an example, though, of a game where you use the theme as the overarching thing pulling everything together? I guess, you know, like a game like Space Hulk where you talk about, like, you know, when you're doing the command points, you can say, well, you know, this is, oh, you sure. know, the the commander from over top and he's you know giving you you know hints about what to do or telling you the map and the or the action points or you know the aliens only move six because or you have to flip over the tokens because you can see them at this point but can't see them at this point and you know sort of that integration of of why things work a certain way so some of the games that where I necessarily feel the need to explain what's going on, one of them that came to mind is Cerebria, The Inside World, just because unlike a lot of other games, it's not going to become emergently apparent about what's going on. And I do kind of like the theme independently. If I, Even if I didn't like the theme of Cerebria, I'd probably feel the need to say, okay, we're actually building the identity of a human person, and that's what the central scoring tower represents. I, of course, go into the deep metaphysical and nearly religious implications of Lupin Louie whenever I teach Lupin Louie, because it would be borderline malpractice not to. I, ever since your re-explanation of Great Western Trail as actually delivering cows to the alien overlords for probing purposes, I can't help but explain that that's what the game is actually about. And then, there, there, then, of course, there's the Game of the Year 2020, which demands an explanation as to what's going on, which is to say Cosmic Frog. I defy anyone to teach a game of Cosmic Frog without going into at least a little bit of detail about what on earth these Cosmic Frogs are doing and why and what they're like. In fact, there are some there's some properties, though, where I actually have to feel the need to step back. Most of the time I err by not going into detail about the theme. But there's La Révolution Française, La Patrie en danger. Uh, I have to consciously limit myself to a small number of comments about what is going on over the course of the game. And then, of course, there's any game themed about Macross. Last time, the last Macross game I taught was uh, Robotech Brace for Impact. And any time someone would ask a question, I would naturally be thinking, well, there was this time when actually what happened was they were attacked by... Okay, but that doesn't matter. And I had to say that like four or five times because after explaining the rules, I would then feel tempted to give like an episode synopsis about various things that occurred. Not my proudest moment. I think Anachrony also does a great job of integrating theme and making 
uh, teaching the game that much easier. It's like, you know, you need to go here to get energy. You need to power up your mechs for this reason. You have to go back in time for this reason. You have to fix the timeline because of this. And this is breaking over here because of that. And you're going to have to, you know, switch these ge gears over here to fix that part. And so those all sorts of sort of meshes together and makes it more understandable on what the overall mission is to do in the game. I don't know if I agree, but I can see where you're coming at. I mean, I, I, I think Anachrony is one of those games that's an example where just by virtue of explaining what's happening, the thematic elements kind of emerge. The only exception to that is the evacuation condition, where that, I think, demands some sort of broader explanation going a little bit off script into the story of the game. But past that, I think I've gotten away with, and again, I'm not saying I'm, I'm serving my fellow players well. But I think in the past I've gotten away with, okay, and here's how you power your time machine and you're going back in time and blah, blah, blah. I don't feel the need to offer any sort of broader context. It, it kind of explains itself. But I take your point. And then the other thing I was wondering in this sort of topic is what sort of game mechanisms break this script for us? You know, like why do you suddenly have to change up how you explain a game? I was thinking there are some games that sort of are totally, you know, out of the you know, vein of how other more normal games work. It's like, you know, when someone explains a game, people have played so many games, they can sort of just put everything in steps. It's like, oh, deck builder, you do this. And, you know, you, of course, you throw away the rest of your cards at the end and you draw your new hands. You know, a lot of things are assumed, but when a game totally, you know, turns that around and does something completely different, then you have to sometimes change up how you explain how it works. That's an example of going off script, though, because usually I try not to compare games to other games. You know, some people are like, well, you know, you, you, you draw at the beginning of your turn rather than the end of your turn, like this other game. It's like, why bother trying to situate it and comparing it to other games? But when it comes to some things like deck builders, whether you discard your hand at the end of your turn is a big set of, like, discarding your hand at the end of, the, uh, of your turn is a standard element of the overwhelming majority of deck builders. So when you don't, it is worth stressing that. And that is kind of going off script a little. Oh, yeah. I guess go back to G.I. Joe, I guess, because G.I. Joe, I guess, is the topic. Because it does do something different. Like a lot of new deck builders, you know, it goes right into your hand. You can use it right away or it goes right in the G.I. Joe deck building game. When you purchase a card, it goes right to the top of your deck. So you're drawing it right away in your next just hand. Just like Mage Knight. So just like Mage Knight. So it is something different. So another big bugbear when you're explaining rules are when there are when there are like a deck of cards that have all sorts of different abilities or tiles that are of all sorts of different rules. And there is no way you're going to go over every single one of these things. So two examples are like Orleans. Mm. They have like phase one buildings and phase two buildings. And you're not going to sit there and explain what every single building does. You're just going to say, Hey, there's some buildings that are over there. They do all sorts of things. They're essential to the game. If you don't understand how they work, you're going to lose. <laughs> but there they are. <laughs> well, it's true though, right? I, I think you're exaggerating the extent to which you leave your fellow players at the mercy <laughs> of whatever's happening. There are, of course, exceptions to this in that in some cases, there's a, a, a class of buildings or a class of special powers that are so consequential that you do need to flag them specifically. It's true. In Orleans, we do do that. We we sort of pick out the ones that we, we see used more often or we feel are a little more powerful than the others. And we do say, hey, well, here are the ones that are popular and people usually use and explain how they work and that that helps them You know, when it's not their turn. They can look through the others and sort of gauge out how they work. Also comes to mind are a lot of the ones that are particularly consequential for endgame scoring. You know, whether it's Puerto Rico, whether it's Race for the Galaxy, you know, those things where it's like, well, you're buying this for endgame scoring, and it can be worth massive amounts of points. And if you want to be competitive, you probably want to try to get one most of the time. And FAM is another example of that. I love FAM, but they have, you know, over 80 cards that are going to come up during the game, and they all do different things. And some of them will give advantage to people who have played before. They'll know they're coming up. They'll see they're coming up in some people. And there's no way you're going to go through the whole deck and explain what all these cards do pre-game. Another big category of games that causes me to break my script is when there is a central conceit to the game that drives much of what's going forward. So the paradigmatic example for this about how I explain games differently is Sidereal Confluence. Now, I should stress, I don't know why I do this because it makes perfect sense to me but I tend 
some people don't respond to it very well. So this is very much a kind of thing that I keep doing for no good reason. So take that for what it's worth. In Sidereal Confluence, how I start explaining the game is, here's how a converter works. You know, I show them a card. It's like the overwhelming majority of things you're going to be doing over the course of this game have to do with converters. This is how you operate a converter. This is what the information on the converter means. And there are a variety of ways to get converters that I'll talk about later. And you can loan converters, etc., etc. Now, I this is to the exception of other games where, you know, there might be a battle system, but I'll usually let that wait until I talk about how you start a battle. There might be an auction system, but I'll let that wait until you actually have to start the auction, etc., etc. So not every key mechanism, I think, should be the first thing that you explain. Uh, but when it comes to some games that, that are driven by a central novel conceit, that is how I will lead things off. Then there's the exceptions. Tons of exceptions. And where do you draw the line of where you're going to introduce exceptions and, and you know, how long are you going to take in the rules explanation to tell them all the different things that might or might not ever happen during the game? Yes. And where to stick them. That's often, usually things like exceptions or, like, endgame scoring is a little bit of detail that I often forget. You know, every ten gold is worth a point, or every two of these cubes are worth a point at the end of the game. But at least there's an obvious place to stick them and shove them during the endgame scoring. So when I remember to talk about them, I know where it happens. But when it comes to exceptions, when it comes to weird, obscure things where it's like, well, generally this process works this way, do you append it at the end of the discussion of that particular process? Do you append it at the end where you just lump all the exceptions together? Do you just leave it alone? And then if you see the exception starting to manifest and then head it off at the pass, I, I don't know that there's a good answer here. And I usually make different decisions based on the context. Another area which I never know when or how to introduce is tiebreakers. Because, especially when talking about victory conditions, I find that it's best to be punchy. And that's very much how I, I, I tend to skip, stick to my script. These are how you get points. There you go. And tiebreakers are very frequently the kind of thing that causes people, myself included, to shut their minds off. It's like, oh, well, this is a tiebreaker. I don't need to worry about it. Or this is just a, an ancillary sub-process. But sometimes the likelihood of a tiebreaker triggering is very, very high. And you need to worry about these things a great deal. Or, and or it influences how you play the game up to that point. Uh, one example that comes to mind is the king is dead. And the king is dead, scores tend to be relatively low. And tiebreakers are very, very important. And the tiebreakers are also exceptions because once you hit tiebreakers, weird corner cases start to emerge immediately. But the problem is you have to explain how it works. Otherwise, people are not going to know how to pursue their own victory conditions. This is true even of simple games, like Crash Octopus. Crash Octopus, people need to know the tiebreaker, I think, because the final scores are apt to be very, very parsimonious and small. You know, you might have a three-way tie with a score of three, and so it's important that people understand what the tiebreaker is, which is, you know, again, an unfortunate corner case and not the kind of thing that fits cleanly into your standard rules explanation. I really feel that usually for us, that is usually the rule that comes up in the last yeah. turn, where... Then people look at the scoreboards like, oh, look, we're all pretty close. So what's the tiebreaker again? <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's awful. Like you put it in the rules explanation. You feel like you may be wasting people's time. You feel like they may be tuning out. You feel like they may be turning off the comprehensive part of their brain. So you're going to have to repeat it anyway. Or you can save it near the end for when you remember it. And then you might have that person in the corner of the table. Now, I mean, look, if it's Crash Octopus, that's not really a, a huge deal. But for if, if people are very competitive in nature, or if it's been a three-hour long, heavy, dry Euro game, and suddenly you announce to people, oh, by the way, uh, the tiebreaker isn't the obvious thing. Uh, the tiebreaker is this uh, tertiary resource that nobody's been paying attention to. It's player order. <laughs> the best one. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, that's the other point I have here when you said about, you know, repeating the rule. It's like you've repeated the rule for the third time because people, the players claim that you never said it in the first place. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, the the And then after you said that, you re you, you explain how boats work again. <laughs> of course. Well, one, one area that is a huge area of discourse for us, which is going off script, is the constant, relentless insults to everyone else at the table uh, during the rules explanation. Usually not related to the game. It's true. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nor the person that is giving the explanation. It's, it's how we express affection. It's just how we do. It's how we do's. So this is a classic case, I think. General patterns, general policies, general concepts are very useful things. Heuristics are great. Shorthand is wonderful. But the problem is they can induce all these blind spots. <laughs> and <laughs> remembering to overcome these blind spots or to address them in specific games can be a very difficult thing to do. 
And it is very important. Like I said, I, I've been bringing a lot of people into the hobby this year, uh, people from work and people from outside of work. And they've been, you know, doing it the old way we did. They'd show up with a game and everyone would sit down and read the rule book. And I would try to explain to them how important it is for someone to know how to play before you start to, to give people that first time board game experience. The fact that they're there, they get taught the game, and then they're right into playing it. They're not frustrated, not understanding the rules or, you know, trying to push through this rule book, trying to explain how this game works. There's a rules explainer. They know how to play. They teach the game. And your first experience with board games is a great one. Hopefully it's a little bit more time efficient and conscientious of people's spare time. Yes. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all of our sundry contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. We've got a Board Game Geek Guild. We've got Patreon, Twitch, and all manner of other ways to get in touch with us. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. It's, it's Patreon Discord. Just so you know, it's not Patreon Twitch. Patreon no, Discord. No, that was a list, Walker. That was a list. Oh, Patreon. Comma. Yeah. Got it. it. It didn't sound like that. And yet here we are. And yet here we are. If, if you don't sign off, people are going to get very confused and angry. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bickey. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. and welcome to the glorious return of Masterpiece Theatre in honor of His Grace, the Reverend Dr. Dr. Vincent, Duke of Diesel, Esquire, OBE. And we have been welcomed here with the dulcet tones of Kay Henley of Letters to Cleo. Didn't you know that, that, Letters, that Kay Henley, the singer of Letters to Cleo, was the one who sings for Josie and the Pussycats? No, I did not. It is not Rachel Lee Cook singing the excellent songs of Josie and the Pussycats. It is, in point of fact, Kay Henley. We are talking about the movie Josie and the Pussycats. Walker, your thoughts? My thoughts. It was very interesting. I had, I saw it when I was a very young child. Probably went in the theater when it first came out. You were a very young child since... in 2001? No. no, I was not. <laughs> that doesn't sound right at all. No. But th- it's very, very tongue-in-cheek. They're, they're, they, they're giving you this, you know, subliminal messages and music all the while hitting you with... So much product placement, it is painful. So it's all very tongue-in-cheek and all very silly. Eugene Levy's in it, for God's sake, so it's got to be a fantastic movie, which it is. So Josie and the Pussycats, to me, is the best example of a movie that is better than it should be. Better than it has any right to be. This is a licensed tie-in to an obscure comic book, back before comic book movies were mainstream or good, right? And... It's actually, I would argue, it's it's silly a lot of the time, but I would argue that it's actually a very high quality satire. So this was this was long before product placement became a standard acceptable thing in almost all mainstream entertainment. And this is a satire of product placement before any of that happened. Just a quick note before you go any further, because you said it was you know based off a comic, and there's such a fantastic shout out. I to know that in in the movie where they're in they you know they're sudden record deal they're on a private jet and they're like i don't even know what i'm doing here and but why are you here and they turn to the sister they're like why are you here and she's like because i'm in the comic and they're like what (laughs) yeah it's a it's a beautiful fourth wall breaking incident they break the fourth wall uh one other time i think it's just part and parcel of the satire that infuses all this movie the product placement is so egregious and so obviously laughable that there's an evian sign in the manatee tank underwater where the manatee are swimming at the aquarium it is utterly marvelous, and I think actually the, the reason why I say it's satire rather than just parody or, or just reference is because there's this idea that in order to drive commerce, we need to manipulate people via subliminal messaging and pop music, 
when in point of fact the rest of the movie is demonstrating the extent to which commerce has infiltrated media anyway, right? That juxtaposition, which is entirely conscious, I would argue, is why the movie, I think, is, is an example of excellent satire. And of course, again, lovely other satirical moments like Eugene Levy talking about what makes America so great. He's a Canadian actor. He's there yeah, I know. He's there to cash a check. And he, he indeed makes reference to his own body of work while doing so. Oh, geez. There's so many amazing things in this film. I Just listing them all would take forever. But I will say the following. Parker Posey needs to be in more things. Am I right? It's so true. It's true. In that opening video, the Devon video at the beginning. Du jour. Is, du jour, sorry. Du jour. So good. It remi- Seth Green. That actually, oh, my goodness. That opening uh, and the, the rapturous reception of the crowds and the uh, the over-the-top leather pants and, and various other accoutrements reminds me an awful lot of our reception at Shucks when we when we arrived. The only salient difference being that my flame-colored boa was significantly larger and poofier. It's true. And my hat, my top hat, was slightly higher. It's true. Walker, swag means hygiene. Swag means friendship. Swag means crash positions. <laughs> it's so true. Honestly, like it, it's, it's, it is redonkulous the extent to which this movie is good. I, I just have one bit of trivia, though, in addition to the fact that Kay Hanley was uh, the, the, the one who sings the... the, the Excellent songs of Josie and the Pussycats. Do you know who was considered briefly for the role of Valerie? Beyonce. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> that, I think, would have been a different movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it would have been, yes. It would have sent a different message, that's for sure. Well, the, but that was, the. I mean, Beyonce has always been Beyonce and will always be Beyonce. But I think Beyonce at the turn of the century was not quite the Beyonce we know now. No. Suffice to say, uh, Josie and the Pussycats sincerely has my highest possible recommendation. If you haven't watched it, you absolutely should. It is an amazing movie, and it's aged very well. And, final note, even though it's a fourth generation, it has a Mustang in it. It's true. And if you're a Lost in Space fan, you'll it's got some nice cameos in there as well. Yeah, my understanding is that Parker Posey is in the new Lost in Space. Yes, she plays Dr. Smith. Well, then clearly I should give it a shot because I feel like I need more Parker Posey in my life. And that's on top of Alan Cumming, who's brilliant in it. And I would argue that all three of the Pussycats are most excellent. I even liked Tara Reid. I even thought she was funny. Is she the drummer? Yes. She Yeah, she was in a uh, Van Wilder movie with uh, Deadpool, Too Tired to Remember. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan, yeah, Ryan Reynolds movie. She was very good in that as well. I don't know about the rest of her body of work, but that scene where she encounters fans and they start screaming at that, at her and she starts screaming at them and runs away, I thought that was great. Gets a laugh out of me every time. Anyway, Josie and the Pussycats, marvelous movie. Thank you very much for joining us for Mass Peace Theater. We don't know when we'll be back, but we probably will sooner or later. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>